me introduce uh, Scott James Remnant talking uh, uh, about uh, package management and version control. I was trying very hard not to say package control and version management. So, <laughs> <laughs> so he hasn't actually had enough fear. Okay, so this is going to be basically a rehash of a talk I gave at Ubuntu Down Under. Um, it's not related to dpackage, this is the stuff I do for Canonical every day of the week when I'm not hacking on Debian stuff, um, but it's hopefully potentially interesting for Debian, and Debian may want to actually play with it and use it. Um, the talk's actually quite short, it's not actually supposed to fill the 45 minutes we've got here, because it was only done for a 20 minute talk, so um, basically if anyone has any questions or anything wants to discuss, I want to run this a bit more of a boff than a talk to kind of fill out the, the time a little bit. So feel free just to stick your hand up and shout out a question or comment or anything like that as we go. Um, so the basic introduction of this talk is a tool that Canonical has been working on called the Hypothetical Change Set Tool, which proves just how bad I am at coming up with names for things, as anyone who's um, experienced any of my software will know. Um, the, the idea of the HCT was um, to make um, handling source packages a lot easier. Um, we all kind of um, have in Debian source packages, um, which we have an upstream for, and um, stuff like that. And it's, it can be a bit of a pain to kind of manage them sometimes, especially when you want to actually take into account things like updating to a new upstream, um, adding new patches, and things like that. So the idea of the um, HCT was to do all this using revision control systems. Um, revision control systems are pretty good at doing what they do. Um, they're pretty good at losing your data. Um, they're pretty good at giving you nonsensical command line UIs. But they're also, fortunately, um, especially the more modern ones, pretty good at helping you do merges and you know, pull in new changes and do diffs across things and things like that. So um, hopefully this is going to be um, kind of an interesting uh, talk on um, you know, about what we think is the way of doing it. Um, so let's, what is the HCT? Um, it's not too bad, it does actually fit on the slide, that's pretty impressive. Um, basically an HCT is about source package management. Um, binary packages you build and are handled through things like dpackage. Um, if you wanted to see the dpackage2 talk that was on Friday morning, you should have got up earlier. I did, <laughs> just. Um, so, uh, but this is, this is about source package management. Um, what we do is we use source package management and we use bizarre branches. Now, bizarre, uh, does anyone here not know what the bizarre is? Everyone's come across it. Yeah? It's um, Canonical's fork of TLA, basically. That we, we kind of got to the situation where we wanted to use TLA for things and there was too much pain involved with it. So um, we um, basically forked it and, um, you know, <laughs> as you do, and created a, a separate branch which we call Bazaar, which is focuses on giving it a friendly user interface. I mean, a lot of the ideas, we stole a lot of the UI for it from Subversion, and it's being developed by uh, Robert Collins, who was one of the upstream Arch developers before he joined Canonical. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's slowly progressing. And there's another project called Bazaar NG, which is a um, project to create a completely new version control system which has similarities possibly to Bazaar but is actually not based on Arch. So, you know, that's, so, you know, it's what we think is a good future for version control. I mean, we fund these projects um, simply because we think it's the right way and the right way forward and uh, this is it's unrelated to Ubuntu except for, as I'm going to talk about here, um, otherwise we just use Ubuntu slides for a bit. Um, the, um, the basic way it works is that tar files, you know, the upstream tar file, the p, p threads tar file in glibc, um, the whatever crap you've got in your source package are managed as branches. So there are tree, or trees in particular senses, and so are the patches you make to them. And we actually, um, we go one step further, the patches you have to a particular tar file are made up as um, branches of the tar files. So, um, Let's, if we take the X-supplicant thing, which um, I was just playing with while we were waiting, um, the X-supplicant original tar file would have a branch which contained all of the history of the original tar file, um, and then off that you'd have um, the X-supplicant file names dpatch branch, which contains just the changes as change sets from the X-supplicant tar file for the um, 
sort of the asset to make that actual patch. Um, and it, it's basically built up on these simple things. Um, what, the, what the magic of the HTT does is it can help you manage these just by referring to the patch file names. You say you want to work on a particular patch file name, and um, it will just do so. And um, it also lets you do, you know, lets you build it into an actual Debian source package that currently exists today, with you know creating patch files for you and so on. Um, so the advantages for a single developer of doing this, um, doing this kind of thing in revision control, um, basically the, the, the sort of workflow there to, correct, to change a patch. Let's say you want to change the XLP file name's patch. Um, you just get it, edit the files. So you just literally. By getting the patch, you get a working copy which contains the original source with the patch applied. You edit the files in it. You add and remove the files just using version control commands like baz add, baz well, remove. It actually provides some versions of these things. And then you commit the changes. And that's all you have to actually do to edit the patch. There's no kind of worrying about diff and patch and things like this. The, the, the way it kind of works is built into a version control system. Now, I'm going to try and do a demo here, but given this was actually just set up just now, it may not actually work. So, um, Let's have a go, shall we? Well, what we should... Oh, okay. Take the terminal. How do I do that? Oh, hang on. Terminal. No, not that. <laughs> oh, look. Ah! Well, <laughs> oh, that was a lot. Right, okay, we've got a terminal. <laughs> so, you can... So, the, the HTT command kind of based on the kind of... It, the source command get and work on source package just a little bit like that to get source. And you give it silly URLs. Uh, this was picked by Phil this morning. Well, just about two minutes ago. Um, ignore um, the local host bit is just because I'm trying to do a demo here, and my network access doesn't seem to accept the fact that there is more to life than HTTP. Um, and um, normally you just say source source package, um, and that just gives, lets you work on the source package. And we, so we can go into the subject directory, we can see what's in the source package. So this source package has um, the original source, which is a subject 101 Debian directory. It's got a patch of the tarball, and it's got another patch of the tarball. Oh, I'll just roll off the top. Um, and it has a tarball, the orange tar DZ. Um, so if we wanted to edit this subject file names patch, this is probably where it goes all wrong. <coughs> You can edit it, go to the XUP file names patch, and there it is with the original source applied. Um, with so the, the you know, and we can, you know, do that, and you can use version control commands and stuff to see that the author's file has been modified and things like that. And um, if you want to prove that it actually works. Um, I fully believe in shortening things as far as possible, so it lets, lets you kind of cheat a lot. Um, <coughs> my laptop is slow. If you want. Um, so this is this is a little bit hacky, but you wouldn't so have to. Orange Tar GZ is a pack, is a branch name there. Uh, it's Orange Tar GZ is part of the file name of the tarball. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm just cheating for the purposes of demo more than anything else. Um, so, oops, we should then be able to diff, you know, show you the differences of uh, X applicant 101 Orage and. Uh, as you can that. Mm? Right. Um, yeah, this is going to really yeah. look big. But as you can see, we can see the differences from the Orage and this patch branch now is we've added some random Joe to the author's file, and there's some changes to the documentation, and whatever. whatever it's, with a file name change there, so you can see that, you know, and you do this in revision control, and um, for those people who uh, know about sort of um, BAS, can actually, do, uh, uh, this is going to be, can actually look at the branches, um, and look at it, up, uh, and, you know, you've got Orish Tarball, there's a packaging, which is the Debian directory, there's the Exceptical File Names branch, which, um, uh, Exoplicant uh, file names 101, which is um, a tag of the Orish Tar GZ with the changes from the, the 1.01 release merged in. And if we'd committed, then we can 
do that, and I've actually got to commit to my own thing. So the basic idea is you can do all this using revision control. Um, to edit a patch is just, you know, literally check out the branch of the patch, change the make the changes you want to it, and commit it. Um, which, which for us, you know, makes the workflow a little easier. You don't have to worry. I mean, a lot of this is based on ideas that things like dpatch do today, and things like uh, CDBS stuff and things, but with the idea is to do it in a revision control system rather than just trying to fake one on disk. Um, there's advantages for a team as well. Um, version control makes collaboration really easy. Um, as anyone who's kind of used Subversion or CVS or stuff like that will know, um, if you've got one single repository for your package, um, you can just collaborate on them. You don't have to worry about swapping patches, you don't have to worry about mid-air collisions with each other too much. Um, by actually representing the patches as branches rather than a patch file being used to Subversion, um, if two people edit the same patch branch, but edit different files, that's fine. If you're both, if you've done like the GNOME people do, and they, you just submit the patch into Subversion, then if two people edit the patch in different ways, you're going to get a conflict both either way. By representing it as an actual branch, you can, you know, it's, it's just as easy as working on the branch with another person. Um, <clears throat> you can work on the different patches without conflict um, quite easily. I mean, you can do that today with just by clicking patch Subversion, but here you can obviously work on different branches. You're in different logical spaces. With a distributed revision control system like Bazaar, you can um, sort of work on it on your own machine and in sort of away from you know when you're on a plane or something like that quite easily and still commit and stuff. And obviously you can work on the same patch using updates and merges. So you know you, there's advantages for a single developer. It makes their workflow easier. You know we've, we've got tools today to kind of help them do that without using a revision control system. This does it with a rigid revision control system. Obviously there's um, I think it was probably the last. I know there isn't. There is one more. Um, so obviously there is particular advantages um, as well. I mean, if you're doing it without a revision control system, um, hands up here who's been playing around with this source packet for two weeks and realized everything they've done is completely wrong and to roll back to the version they had two weeks ago. Anyone done that? Most of us. Very easy with a revision control system. You just back out your changes. Um, with the file-based system, you have to hope you kept them around, um, especially if the two weeks ago wasn't the last upload. Um, so there, there's various advantages to doing things like this in a revision control system as opposed to just, you know, on the fly and faking one. Um, the way HTT works, um, it primarily it's, it's written in Python. I mean, it's, uh, it's going to be an open source tool, so if anyone's going to attack it. Um, to get all of its data about source packages, um, where they are, what they're called, what's in them and stuff like that, it uses something that the Ubuntu have been working on, the Canonical have been working on, called um, Launchpad, which is a um, giant database of um, information about the open source world. and um, the um, kind of data in there is, you know, like kind of a, it's a kind of a super cross between Fresh Meat and SourceForge and um, Bugzilla, every Bugzilla of the world and DevDev system of the world and language translation system. It gets a bit hairy, um, but in there we actually do have the information about source packages. So that's where we get our information from. So that's this next slide, um, which disappears off the side. So um, the basic idea is, um, if you want to publish your package. Um, without publishing to a distro, you can um, just push it onto, you get like a person, with your account, you'd get a personal space and a personal kind of app repository and things like that, and it'll automatically be built for you and, um, you know, set up. Um, it'll appear in Soyuz, which is our um, sort of source package management system. You get, obviously, a personal apt archive with a source package in it. The build these go and build the package, and um, it gets placed in the apt archive. Uh, as you can see, this is pretty much aimed at the Ubuntu people, because but um, the Debian people could use this themselves or set up their own buildies, and you know it's so, the stuff to do this. This kind of these kind of hooks are not the required parts in this particular sense, but you know. Um, so um, I think that was yeah. So what I actually wanted to talk about at this slide is what we're actually doing. Um, Canonical employees about forty people at the moment. I think it is. Um, only of which 10 or 12 of them work on Ubuntu. Um, we actually have two other major projects we do. Um, one of them is Bazaar, Bazaar NG, which is the team I work for. So I do revision control stuff every day, which is kind of why I get to do Debian stuff in my free time still and uh, not worry about, the, worry about it too much. Um, the, um, so that, and then the major part of Canonical's workforce, um, there's about five of us on the Bazaar team, the major part is over 20 people work on the launch pad. Um, and apart, basically, one thing we're trying to do is um, 
it's, it's kind of evil in some ways, but uh, it's also kind of cute, um, is um, build a model of the, the open source world for everybody <coughs> to use. Um, so, for, let's, so let's sort of build up the foundations here. So this is going to probably try and keep up. Um, <laughs> the, um, the basic thing, so for every, so we start off with every package in Debian, Stroke, Ubuntu, the, the package sets are supposed to be the same. Um, and for each of those, we find out where the upstream is. Who's the upstream? Where's their website? What's the fresh meat page? What's the source forge page? You know, things like that. Um, we, so we register in Launchpad the information about the upstream. So in particular, this case, we'd have the information about the exception and upstream in there. Um, generally, um, upstream these days have repeating control systems of their own. They might have their source code in CVS or in Subversion or Keeper. <coughs> Um, or um, any of the other kind of various things. Um, so we take that, we register that in our system, and we have some very large servers that warm Elmo's bum when he's in the data center, and um, they sit there scanning for changes in their subversion CVS repositories, etc., and convert them into BAS repositories. So we have distributed revision control, you know, ARC repositories available for every upstream that we care about. Um, so we do this as a free service. I mean, the GNOME people have been quite interested in this, that we've done it on most of their archives so far. And, you know, we, we import the full history and we kind of go on. Obviously, if a couple of times people have come to us and said, oh, can you stop doing that? We haven't got our bandwidth, so we do. But um, in general, people have actually been quite happy with this, who've found out about it, because it means, well, it gives more users a chance, you know, people who use Baz or Arch a chance to actually work on their source packages who don't know CVS or Subversion. Um, so we do that. We also look at, say, where the FTP releases get made. And um, you know, we have a system which goes and fetches those too and registers them in the database so we know what releases there are of Exarchicant and um, where the target was, uh, what, its, you know, what its details are. And we import that into BAS too. And we import those as branches off the upstream CVS import. So for a given upstream CVS, we then know where each of the tarballs come off um, you know, or where they nearly came off because they released the tarball and went, ah, we forgot some changes, stuck them in the tarball and didn't put them in CVS. That happened a few times. Um, and uh, so we do that. We then take the Debian and we look at Debian. We see what day to day is published in Debian, what versions and stuff like that. We grab the source packages down. We make branches off the upstream tarballs for the source packages. We import the orange tarballs. We import all the patches from it. And um, do that. So in our revision control system, we have Debian, as represented as changes to upstream and upstream CVS. And we do it for Ubuntu as well. And then we do it for Red Hat and SUSE and Mandrake and uh, Skola Linux and uh, Kuala Linux. And we do it for the whole lot. We've got some very, very big disks and some fast servers. So what we have in revision control at this point is basically the entire open source world, as from the point of view of Debian and Ubuntu, in revision control. Once you've got this, it, some things turn out surprisingly easy. Um, distributed revision control systems like BAS and Arch and what have you, they do merges very easily. Um, they do diff very easily. Because they keep a history of everything and where everything came from, even when it's cross branches and stuff, and when it's been cherry bricked, they actually are very, very good at just doing a sort of what changed between A and B. So the question of what changed between the X supplicant file names patch and X supplicant is as easy as the what change between the ex-supplicant file is patch in Debian and in Ubuntu. So that becomes very easy. And actually, take the changes that Ubuntu made and merge them into my source package in Debian becomes one command. Um, and this gets very, very, very simple. Likewise, what changes have upstream made when their new release become very simple. You merge in the new upstream release and commit it. And that's, that's all you have to do to maintain upstream. Um, what changes, you know, you can then start looking at things. You can say, well, Red Hat have an ex applicant source package too, and they've got two or three new patches in it. Well, I, you know, steal them. Put them in your own package, make them branches of the Red Hat ones, and then when you come back, come back a week later and um, have a look, well, the Red Hat have made some more changes. You can merge those and commit and keep up to date with Red Hat. And then you get that. It becomes very, very simple at this point to keep the entire, basically, all of the distros in the world in sync just by using you know, revision control for everything. Um, obviously, it requires a massive initial investment to do this. Fortunately, we found a multi-millionaire um, <laughs> who, who thinks these things are kind of cool. Um, and 
Yeah, so that's kind of where we're going, and that's kind of what we've been trying to do. Um, a lot of the stuff that you've probably seen um, I do, I mean, the, my, probably my most visible thing I've done for Ubuntu, rather than Google, is the uh, patches directory. Um, uh, has anybody actually here used that? Okay, so a few people. Um, the uh, patches directory is on, the, uh, my, is on my people Ubuntu con twiddle scarf patches. Um, I think. And um, basically, it's the it's updated daily and is the set of um, pat difference between Debian and Ubuntu. And it's generated with a prototype of this system. Um, the the real version is being put together now. I mean, we've got we're at the point where we're importing all the upstream CBS and Arch repositories and finishing off the touches for the um, tarballs and the source packages. So, you know, we, we're, we're hoping to come along quite quickly at this point. Um, as you can see, I managed to do. This is what you're doing. As you can see, I managed to do an import of X supplicant this morning, you know, while everybody was filing in after. You know, we've, we've got it pretty good at this point. Um, and, um, yeah, so hopefully this is something that's going to be available to everyone. All the art repositories, the buzz repositories are public. Anyone can get them. Anyone can make branches <coughs> of them. Everyone can make copies of them and sort of work on them. Obviously, because, you know, making a copy of it still includes the patch logs. It's, you know, it's, it's a branch of it. It works. Um, it, make, it changes the world from seeing everything from one package and everything derived off it just to a, a large farm out there of possible patches you can make and possible changes you can make. And you can then, it makes cherry picking from not just Debian and Ubuntu, but the Red Hat based distribution, the Ocean based distributions, the Gentoo. We hired a Gentoo developer about a year ago for a few months to write us the Gentoo importer. Forgot about that one. Um, so it makes sort of merging stuff between various distributions quite easy. And, uh, that's basically where we're trying to go with this. I mean, that's, it sounds kind of weird to sort of say now, but this is actually the whole idea we actually found it in on originally, was building this provision control system. And um, we, um, the, the Ubuntu stuff was in, always intended to be an uh, example of how well it worked. Um, the distro guys did such a fantastic job getting it out in six months that no one thought they'd ever do it, that the, the distro got released without the actual tools it was supposed to be built on, which they still build Ubuntu the old-fashioned way to this day. Um, but in general, it's uh, sort of coming along now, and we're hoping to be able to let everybody play with this soon. So that's pretty much an introduction to the thing and what we're trying to do with it. So we have plenty of time, so this was only intended to be a 20 minute talk. So hopefully, there's lots and lots of questions to uh, ask. And I'll try to remember to repeat. So, um, Jonathan, stuff his hand up first, and I'll, I'll go down. I'm missing Hyatt's Revolutionary about the HCT stuff. Because you've shown us about how you can manage branches about patches and whatever, which is all well and good, but I can do that with my revision control system at the moment. What I was expecting to see later on was how HCT magically produces me a targz file and a Debian patches directory and something I can actually upload, rather than me having to manually apply all the patches into the source again and then... I mean, I have all my separate patches as trees. Right, that's... Signs of so the question was... Um, what, what about it is revolutionary? I mean, the stuff I showed you there is just managing patches and stuff like that. Um, you know, how do you actually turn that into something you can upload? Um, good question, actually. I kind of forgot to demo that one. I'll probably break. It's still beta software. But <laughs> it's still alpha software, really. Um, you can assemble a source package. Why is that taking so long? Um, you can assemble a source package quite quickly. Um, yeah, but in, in general, you can assemble a source package. Uh, there's obviously a bug in this because it is supposed to go a lot faster than that. It's supposed to go. Duh, 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 duh. Um, but um, perhaps you should the, stop working with the wireless. Hmm? Perhaps the others here in the room should stop working with the uh, wireless. It, it did actually crash. <laughs> it did actually crash. I thought it would, but um, yeah. Okay. So the answer is yes. It's supposed to be. You're supposed to be able to assemble the source package from it, and that's broke. Sorry, I can't demo that. Um, but yeah, the HTT HTT assembler, HTT source will actually give you all the time a um, the, the, the complete Debian source package ready for upload. I was supposed to, um, and. Um, they are, um, you know, you, that, that's ready, it's live. Um, changes you haven't committed yet are still merged in, still placed in the source package for you, so you can test them and stuff. Um, as to how it's revolutionary, it's, I don't think it's intended to be necessarily revolutionary. Um, it's intended to be based on what we've got now, but sort of built on, it's basically taking all the tools we've built now and putting them together. I don't think anyone's particularly sort of 
They've taken mills, particularly taken deep patch and um, things like that, and tied them directly to a rhythm control system. They've, they've had their own ways of doing it. Um, the intent is just to put it all together, basically. It's evolutionary rather than revolutionary. So, so you do end up with a source package that is using something like deep patch, so there's a human reader or someone else comes yes. along and wants to look at your source patch and say, I'll get something sensible they can look at. Yeah, so the, the question there is that you do end up with a source package that you use something like Patch or Simple Patches on, um, or Wig and Pen. I mean, the, the Wig and Pen format was kind of, well, I had this in the back of my mind when Elmo and Brendan were discussing this, and actually we turned, they had the same ideas I did anyway, so the idea is you end up with a source package that isn't, you don't need to rebut BAS to do an app to get source. Um, I actually think the GPL tells us we can't do that. I think the GPL tells us we have to ship the original source, not just a pointer to the tables and a pointer to the um, sort of um, upstream revision control systems. So you do end up with a source package you can upload. Um, yes, that was you next, I think. Yeah, um, just in case um, certain space tourists fall off a spaceship and all this money is to be put in a big mattress so they don't land softly, um, and there's no money left for the launch pad. But every Projects are depending on it. Is there a way to make it decentralized? Sorry, the, what, what was the question there? I mean, is there a way to make a launchpad decentralized? If it does not depend on a um, certain company alone. So, so the way the question there was, um, is it possible to make launchpad not dependent on the company itself? Um, I think anyone who's read the news last week will notice that um, the Ubuntu Foundation was set up to manage Ubuntu if Canonical should decide to go away, which I don't think it is. but or if Mark gets bored, or if Mark gets hit by a bus, or any of the other main things. So the Ubuntu Foundation is there today. Um, I think possibly if the launch pad became a major open source project, Mark would do the same. I think he's already demonstrated his um, belief in doing things right and not just hiding things. Um, you know, on the other hand, launch pad is currently a closed source software, but then the XGT isn't directly tied to it. You see it as a data source for the name of packages, so it's not necessarily bad. Kind of connects. Can you explain? How, what, how useful is HTT without Launchpad? All right, so question, um, how useful is HTT without Launchpad? Um, HTT uses Launchpad to get the list of source package names in the distribution and um, you know, get the sources for them and we know where the BAS branches is. Um, it, you know, it's, it uses it just as a data store over XML RPC, so it wouldn't be that hard if Launchpad vanished to kind of move it elsewhere. Um, likewise, also, it wouldn't be hard to copy the data elsewhere. Uh, Mark hates this idea, but <laughs> it's just the way it is. If you can open source everything, you've got to kind of take the bite, and I think he's aware we're going to do it. Yes, um, Andy. Yeah, two questions. One is, if I have some open source project which is not in Launchpad, is there a way for me to get, or if I have a, well, it doesn't even need to be an open source project. If I have source code of some way that's not in the Launchpad, but I want to get, uh, want to use this uh, tools, is there a way for me to do it? So the question there is, um, if you have some software that isn't registered in the Launchpad or is closed source or anything, is there a way for him to use these tools? Um, the Launchpad is just a web app. Um, you can go there and register your own software. It's not limited to the stuff we've registered. And, so and I can do it also, uh, well, if, if for example, I'm not allowed to share this canonical, can I do it on my own servers? Um, I think the answer there is, there's no reason why you couldn't. Um, today, no, but... For example, for example, if I download the Sun case, mm -hmm. I'm definitely not allowed to share this with anybody else. So, um, just to give an example. I don't think there's a decision. There's no decision being made. There's no there, decision yeah. there. I think that it very well could decide that, that people that want to do proprietary software you know, yeah. may, not, may not be able to use that. That may be a... That may be a decision that Canonical will make. I mean, yeah, we, we, have, we haven't got to that position yet. So. I, I mean, yeah, I, my, my general feeling at the moment is it's uh, it, the, soft, the system is designed for open source people, so proprietary people can kind of yeah, it's do it's their own. <laughs> what if, that's what if the software thing. is not proprietary, but you want to work when you don't have internet access? Um, because so the question there is, what if you don't have internet access? Yeah, it, like you don't even have internet access to contact the Launchpad to get the to get the source package names. Um, well, you. Generally, I mean, this is kind of where do you work. Um, it keeps a local cache of everything you've worked on. Um, yeah. So everything you've worked on is available on your laptop. Um, and um, once you've worked on something, you don't actually need to contact the launchpad at all until you're ready to commit it. So, uh, but, or publish it, sorry. You can even commit to your laptop. I don't know, but let, 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 let's say you don't have any internet access at all, and I don't know, so you, you get your Debian uh, CDs or your Ubuntu CDs through the mail or something, you don't have any internet access at all. So at that point, um, the question is, what if you don't have internet access at all? Well, 
If you don't have any tax access at all, you're not going to be able to get the new upstream tarball anyway. So right, yeah, you know no, what sure. you're not going to be able to see what patches are in Red Hat anyway. So there's not really anything yeah. there. Um, I'll just come back to you. Did you have a question earlier? Yeah, but kind of. Possibly. Okay, and Joe. Um, I'm not quite clear on whether you're keeping the actual pristine original tarballs in Subversion or whatever, or if you're just keeping the, like, the set of files. So the question there is, do we keep the original pristine tarballs in, or the set of files that are in them? Yep. We keep the set of files that are in them. Um, we don't keep the actual original pristine tarball, but what we do have is the record of what its MD5 sum was, and what the stats of these files were in it, and we do something very, very sick to ensure that when we reconstruct the original tarball, it has the same MD5 sum if it's not being modified. Like, um, printing the tar file and going over the tar file and hex editing it. <laughs> I mean, it was about five o'clock in the morning and I've been clubbing. It works fantastically. Yeah. 16,000 source packages, it's not broken yet. Okay, we would call that that thing, the dpackage ng or so, <laughs> kind of code. Well, as I said, this, this is not related to dpackage. There's nothing here that's dpackage. No, but trust the of the way of file code. Trust of the clear the Um Yeah, and do you have another question? Yeah, the other question is, is there some easy how-to for, if I'm now a dependent maintainer of some package, mm -hmm. how, what, what's the way to do uh, to use of it? Because usually I don't I don't get you and I ask say, okay, please tell me how to do it. So. Is it how to and where, where is it available? So the question there is there a how to how to do this? Not today, because obviously this is still being written. Um, we're still crashing out when I try and do demos. Um, it's we 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 have a kind of rough. I'm going to find to Brazil pretty much after this conference for three weeks, and or two weeks or how long that? I don't actually know. Um, I'm the world's least organised person, um, and uh, we're, one of our aims there is to put a lot of this stuff and finish it off and get some polish on it and um, it will be completely documented. I mean, I actually like writing documentation, um, which makes me a very strange person, so there will be tutorials and how-tos that will come with it to show you how to use it. Um, Joey, again. Okay, um, where, I, where I'm at after this talk is I'm, try, I'm trying to find what this will do for me, that what I'm currently right. using doesn't do. Mm -hmm. So I might have to briefly explain what I'm currently doing. Okay. I'm keeping things for in subversion, I keep full sources, I keep all the upstream, um, versions as a branch and so on, so I can get all the history I want, I can pull files mm -hmm. I want. I'm not particularly interested in distributed revision control as such, um, so I guess my question, and I'm not particularly interested in separable branches as such. So my question is, what else can this do for me, if anything? So, um, <coughs> so well, Joey's there just explaining just what he does now, and he wants to know what else it will do for him. Um, do you work, in these source packages you work on just yourself or with other people? Um, both. So th I think the, the main advantage to this way is that you can work on a single patch with other people without the conflict on the single patch. Uh, you're already ahead of the curve at this point. You're already using things in revision control, so you're you're already one step ahead of a lot of the other people that this is aimed at. Um, the the one thing we can do, of course, is we can and um, we um, do import the dev help and stuff from your subversion repositories and make it available for anyone else as well. And um, you know this will let you pick those changes up that say you know. Um, a Debian derivative have to make Debian installer to make it red rather than blue because that's their company colors or you know that there are various things there it'll let you do. Well sure I mean, the next single launch pad things I was more interested about the HCT side of things. Yeah I mean, it, it, the, I mean the HCT itself the main thing it'll let you do is it, it gives you a method for taking patches from other people and updating your patches based on what other people have done um, and seeing what Red Hat have done. I don't think it would be DI but um, <laughs> What what Ubuntu have done with Dev with um, DI and with Dev Helper if Colin should get hit by a bus and doesn't stop submitting his patches back and um, it, it gives you a tool for doing that. I think it's probably what it would do for you. It gives you a tool for what what's changed else what not what have I changed, what have other people changed and can I have it back? You know, it, it gives you a tool for doing that, I would say, is what this would do for you. Anyone else? Silent. Oh, there we go. So yeah, you said that you had the, the source for all the uh, open source stuff in, in 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 the world or something like that. Yep. How big is it in bytes? Um, four and six. Hmm. Four and six. So the question there was, how big is the source of the world? Um, I'm just trying to see if there's somebody here who actually might know the answer that one. Uh, no, he's not here. Ah. Uh, um. I don't remember what the numbers we came up with. The current set of just Ubuntu with just no, with no differences was 700 
gigabytes. So. I think it came up to four to five hundred terabytes. <laughs> Big discs. I may mention that. Um, and we have that disk. I mean, the disk space, that's like a tenth of the disk space that's on the system. So it's got to use that. <laughs> 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 Mm? Uh, one question. Are you actually working for Canonical or for some sort of secret service? <laughs> I'm working for Canonical, some sort of secret service. I don't know. I can't probably keep track these days. Um, we're evil, apparently. Mm. Hello. Is there a uh, mirroring my repository? Can I, can I use Launchpad as a kind of my upstream? So, question was there. Can, instead of mirroring his repository, can you use Launchpad as his upstream? Um, once your repository has been mirrored, it's available. Um, if you go to arch.ubuntu.com today, you'll find the um, Baz archives of everything we've imported so far that have been published and been checked to make sure we haven't got bugs in the code. And you know, at that point, you can branch off it yourself and, and make, add patches and commit them back. And yeah, certainly at this point, you could once it's been imported, if you wish to change to Baz. I mean, the only other reason we're doing this, of course, is we're funding revision control systems like Baz. So if the whole world stops using Baz to do their revision control, we win. Um, I don't quite know how we make money from that, but <laughs> this is a generic problem with canonical parts. <laughs> we do all this really cool stuff and then we sit down afterwards and go, so how do we make money from what we've That's just That's the done? next generation after everyone has switched. Yeah. Rob? Well, um, uh, is there going to be a change of ritual because of RNG, or are you just kind of hoping it all works? Ah, so this is quite a good question. Um, is there a changeover issue between Bazaar and Bazaar NG? Um, Baz and Bazaar, or Baz and Baz NG, or however you want to call them. Um, so, as I said in the beginning, Baz itself is a fork of TLA which has got a continually improving user interface and some various changes to the back end. Bazaar, be it Bazaar NG type thing, is a um, brand new revision control system that steals ideas from pretty much all of them out there. It's reasonably influenced by BitKeeper um, and by um, Subversion and Darks, um, with some Darks thrown in and some of its own stuff. Um, so how, do, how is there a changeover issue between these two? Um, well, no. I mean, the Zarin G is written as a Python program. Um, Mark likes Python. thinks the whole world should be written in Python. It's a pretty good language. Good fun. Um, and, um, but, but Baz is a C program. Um, however, the, the evolution of both of them is Bazaar can be a, is basically a toy development project where we can test out new ideas. And once those ideas go stable, they get merged into the C version. And um, the C version kind of is, is evolving towards what Baz and G is evolving towards. So if you can imagine they're starting out sort of here, Baz and G is going that way, and Bazaar is kind of moving towards it. And um, Bazaar has all of the repository upgrade tools in it. So when Bazaar sees your repository isn't old, it will kind of help you upgrade it, you know, help you upgrade your working trees and stuff like that. So there are, there are conversion tools as part of it. Um, the changeover will be reasonably painless at this point because both tools will support that repository format at the point we do it. Um, as to which one will win, the C or the Python, nobody knows. We haven't made that decision. The um, two people in charge of them haven't been told which one's in charge. Um, they, it kind of creates a healthy little competition between Robert and Martin um, to kind of which one's going to win and which one's going to get the better. Uh, the Python limitation seems slightly in the lead today. Um, but we'll also see what happens next week or the week after. Um, so yeah, it, with the the, um, the evolution towards the both of them, bizarre bizarre NG obviously goes in the direction it wants to go. But the C version is, you know, arcing towards it. And the advantage Robert has is all he has to do is take what Martin's done and just implement it. Martin has to do the really hard thinking, which of course is nine tenths of the problem. So Robert just has a simple matter of programming, which as anyone will tell you is not exactly a very acronym anyway. Um, any other questions? What are we doing for time? We have about uh, six or seven minutes. Six or seven minutes. So anyone anyone else? Yeah. So um, HCC allows you to upload Debian source package out of your branches and repositories and stuff. Does mm -hmm. it allow you to do the reverse, or do you have to rely on that being done by Launchpad? So the question there is, HCC allows you to do take a bunch of branches and repositories and make a Debian source package out of it. Does it allow you to do the reverse? Um, Assemble takes your branches and makes the source package out of them. Um, the question there becomes, how do you, you know, if you're, are you talking about taking existing source packages this today and importing it, or are you talking about creating a new source package? Because obviously, creating a new source package is easy. I mean, about, about taking existing source package. I mean, 
Um, do we have to rely on launch pad being there and doing this transport for us? It's a wonderful question because I have to squirm. Um, the answer is, at the moment, the tool we use to do the imports is actually proprietary canonical at the moment. It's um, not a... Um, I think... So I'll explain the reason why it is first. That's probably the, the right answer, and then um, kind of where we're going with it. Uh, the reason why is because Launchpad is intended to be the single repository of everything, and today, if we um, gave it out to everybody, everyone else would go and import their source packages and put them on other systems, and that would defeat the entire object of what we're trying to do. Um, because all the arch IDs would be different, the patch logs would be different, and the way BAS works doesn't allow this, because it's based on TLA. But RNG is fine, I mean, it allows this. So what, it's kind of, it hasn't been released simply because at the moment it would cause more chaos than it would do. It's not, it, it was actually, it's, it's got some interesting code in it, it's got some interesting algorithms to do things, but in by and large, no, it's, it's, not, it's not released today, it's not going to be released tomorrow, but... Certainly, it's not code that's intended to be always kept under the code, it's code that's meant to be released. Um, I think Mark wants to keep a competitive advantage, I suppose, is the right term for a short period. I mean, that's the same as Launchpad in general. Um, the, I mean, it's certainly any source package exists, we would import for anybody. We make it very easy, like one click, to do it. Um, but the code itself isn't actually going to be released on the short term scale. I'm on the long term scale, I don't see any reason why it isn't going to be released. Yeah. So I guess I should point out to anyone who feels a little bit uncomfortable with that that it's certainly possible to import your code into revision control using CVS subversion or Arch mm -hmm. using tools that are in Debian. Yeah, totally. So. <laughs> it's totally possible today to import your code and we can use that. And I mean, import your packages even, whatever. Yeah, it's totally so. possible today with existing tools to import your code into, into revision control if that's what you're interested in. And actually we can use those as well. So it's not, we, we don't mind people doing so that. I just use CVS to Arch and then on that. Yes. The other thing that's worth pointing out is that once you've got published Arch archives with single IDs, you can branch and you can download that entire repository. Yeah, I, um, like I said, one thing about BAS is once you put it published, it's got IDs which are constant, so copies of it and branches of it and wgets of it and rsyncs of it, etc. are as are copies. They, you know, they, they both are compatible with each other. Patches from either one can be merged into each other. Um, once it's published, it's free to everybody. Uh, yeah. Okay, I think that's probably pretty much our time, isn't it? Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's basically well, the stuff I've been doing. Um, hopefully, it might be interesting to some Debian people when it's ready. Um, some of it might not be, but it got me a job to this conference for a week, so I'm excited to talk. So, there we go. Thank you. If anyone actually wants to sort of chat to me, I am going to be around for at least the next six, seven, I don't know, whenever we get a bed. <laughs> okay, thank you. So you assume no singing this night, you only want to stay up for six hours. <laughs> <laughs> Okay.